In the winter of 2002, I met a monster. I was less than a month from turning 13, and it was hunting season in the Ozarks. My dad dragged me out of bed early one morning and told me I was going with him. My first hunting trip. My uncle was in town, and he and my father had planned to spend the weekend in the woods to catch up and hopefully snag a couple of deer. Several details of that fateful outing now escape me, but I clearly recall not wanting to go. Dad and I didn't get along. He didn't get along with much of anyone, actually. He was an alcoholic my entire life, and that year his drinking had gotten particularly bad. Seems like he always had a beer in his hand, and I rarely, if ever, saw him sober. My parents fought constantly, and divorce loomed over the home for most of my childhood. That morning, when Dad decided I'd be tagging along, Mom, as usual, went ballistic. And I, like usual, stuck my face in front of a Game Boy and tuned out the sounds of harsh obscenities and kitchen plates smashing. A few minutes later, Dad and I were on the road, and I was still glued to my video game. It helped to keep my mind off things. At least until Dad's hand closed around the tiny digital screen and he tore it from my grip. Eyes on that game. Look outside. He tossed the handheld to the back of the truck, not even bothering to switch it off, and I was left, as he so respectfully wished, staring out the window. A heavy snow had fallen that week, and the town was covered in white. The sun was just starting to peek out, and Dad drove down mostly empty roads to the house where his brother had been staying. He pulled into the gravel driveway, honked twice, and the front door soon opened with my uncle sticking his head out. He and Dad both shot each other the bird from across the yard, their customary greeting, and before long, Uncle Rich headed to the truck, lugging a big hunting bag over his shoulder and dragging a cooler behind him. As Dad hopped out of the truck and helped him load up, a skinny woman with messy black hair and a pack of cigarettes emerged from the house and stood on the front porch to watch. She pulled a smoke from the pack, stuck it in her mouth, and fumbled around her back pocket for a lighter. Catching sight of me, she smiled and gave a wink and a wave. The doors to the truck opened and we were off, twelve-year-old me sandwiched between the two would-be hunters. Before we had even reached the end of the road, both men had cracked open beers and cranked the radio up. I knew next to nothing about my uncle, except that he lived in Las Vegas and, based on our short trip, had an even more colorful vocabulary than my parents. Dad and Uncle Rich hadn't seen each other in years, but talked like they'd been together only yesterday. Sports, guns, cars, women. They tossed quips back and forth like a baseball, shouting over the stereo the entire time. I focused on the horizon, trying to block them out. My mother's objections quickly became clear. My father had brought me along on a bender, disguised as a hunting trip. For the next two days, I'd be out in the woods alone with my dad and uncle, both drunk as skunks, as they stumbled around carefree with loaded firearms. During the drive, the two paid me little mind, though Uncle Rich did buy me a candy bar at a pit stop while Dad picked up supplies and ice for the cooler. After an hour or two of carelessly weaving around cars on the highway, we finally reached our destination somewhere in Arkansas. We were surrounded by thick woods and inched along a winding road for what felt like forever before finally arriving at a small clearing where an old and rusted camper sat next to a bare campsite. We parked. Uncle Rich hopped out first and began unloading. Dad took a dip of tobacco and told me not to wander off during the weekend, as if I'd have anywhere to go. He told me to keep my quite oversized winter jacket on at all times because it would keep me warm and was bright orange and would stand out in case we came across other hunters. We got out of the truck and I was tasked with finding dry sticks to start a fire, 
As I hunted around the immediate vicinity, Dad and Uncle Rich shuffled back and forth from the truck and camper, setting up shop. They kept the truck's stereo on the entire time, and loudly sang along off-key to the country hits and rock ballads cackling through the speaker system. This seemed to me to be a pretty poor practice for deer hunting, but I knew better than to criticize. When Dad was well and sauced, you didn't try and reason with him. Eventually, bags were unpacked, fire was lit, and Uncle Rich had retrieved three dated lawn chairs from the camper and set them up. We sat in front of the fire for a bit, and Uncle Rich expressed in various profanities just how cold it was outside compared to his home in Nevada. Uncle Rich worked as the head of security at a hotel casino in Vegas, and rambled on with several stories of his exploits while Dad and I both half listened. Finally, in a mood to get moving, Dad rose from his chair with a rusty creak and switched the truck's stereo off. He grabbed his rifle and a bag, Uncle Rich nodded, did the same, and we started walking. Our hunting stand was about two miles away from camp. The sound of birds floated above us and snow crunched beneath as the three of us made our way slowly through the woods. We walked for about an hour and no one said anything. The cold air bit against my face, and I kept my hands in my pockets, each clenched around a cheap off-brand heating pack that Dad had picked up at the gas station. I could smell the trees and the snow, and when the wind blew, the booze from both Dad and Uncle Rich's breath, and I thought how peaceful the walk could have been if I was alone. Eventually, we reached our hunting grounds. The platform stood what looked like ten feet above us, and by all accounts seemed built for just two. Dad climbed the ladder first, then me, then Uncle Rich, and I found myself uncomfortably squished between them as they quietly unpacked their bags, and the wait began. For three long hours, I stayed quiet as the pair silently scanned the scenery in search of sound or movement, and in this I found odd comfort. For here there would be no loud music, no drunken hijinks, just three souls huddled together with two guns and one purpose. Yet, for all our patience, not a single deer passed our way. And as the sun slowly but surely made its way across the sky, I could see and feel my father growing restless. His heavy yet steady breaths became agitated sighs, and he and Uncle Rich began to trade glances, as if one was waiting for the other to call it quits. Finally, with a crack of his knuckles, Uncle Rich spoke up. That's cool. My father sighed again, and looked once more around the woods. Then, just as we moved to begin packing, he held up a finger to quiet us, and slowly raised his rifle toward the trees to our north. Uncle Rich furrowed his brow and tilted his head side to side, trying to match Dad's line of sight. Came my father's voice. And then... I never even heard the rifle fire. My hearing simply stopped, and a second or two later, my ears were filled with a high-pitched ring. I put my hands over them instinctively, but there was no pain. I could see Uncle Rich plugging his, too, while angrily shouting something at Dad. Dad was shouting back, and I closed my eyes. I still wasn't quite sure what had happened. I'd never been near a real gun firing before. It was nothing like the movies. I waited and waited for the ringing to stop. Eventually, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I opened my eyes to see Dad staring at me. The sound of his voice was muffled, and I shouted to him that my ears were ringing, though even as I spoke, I wasn't quite sure if I was loud enough to be heard. He nodded, and I looked around to see that Uncle Rich was no longer in the stand. 
Dad pointed at the ladder, and I got up from my spot and headed down to the ground below. My legs had fallen asleep from sitting for so long, and I took a moment on the top rung of the ladder to wait for the feeling to return. By the time we had all reached the ground, my hearing was starting to come back, and I could make out the sound of Dad and Uncle Rich bickering. Dad was sure he had seen something. Uncle Rich was sure Dad just wanted to fire off a round. The argument continued all the way back to the camper. As the two men unloaded their bags, I made my way to the truck and opened the driver's side door. Reaching in the back, I grabbed some extra hand warmers since mine had gone cold, and I caught sight of my Game Boy. The batteries had long since died, but I hastily stuffed it into my jacket pocket, and then, as instructed, looked for more sticks to restart the fire. Packed in the cooler were several sandwiches, and Uncle Rich tossed me one as we sat down for lunch. He and Dad had both cooled off by then, and the two cracked open another pair of beers. When the afternoon sun began to wane, Dad had passed out in his chair, and Uncle Rich had gone into the woods by himself. I opened Dad's bag and pulled out his flashlight. Screwing off the top, I flipped it upside down to pop out two crusty AA batteries. I swapped them with the ones from my Game Boy and returned the bag just as I had found it. Then, making sure the sound was turned down, I switched the device on and tried catching up to where I had left off that morning. By that time, my ears were back to normal, but my head had started throbbing. As the birds chirped and Dad snored, I sat punching buttons and thinking about Mom back at home, and I cried. Even back then, I wanted so badly to be free. Uncle Rich returned just before nightfall, and when he did, he kicked Dad awake with a laugh, challenging him to a shootout. Dad groggily jumped to his feet, a row of beer cans and bottles were soon hastily lined up toward the woods, and the two stood back against the camper to pick the targets off one by one with admittedly impressive precision. Before long, Dad looked in my direction and beckoned me to come over. I did as told, and he put his rifle in my hands. At twelve years old, I was just over four feet and weighed less than a buck. My arms shook like crazy, trying to keep the rifle held up in the cold, but I didn't want to let Dad down. He lifted the gun with me, jammed the stock tightly against my shoulder, guided my line of sight down the barrel, told me to breathe, and I fired. The shot zipped over the target and smashed into a tree. The men laughed. Dad reloaded the gun, and I tried again. And I missed again. And again. And again. The stock pelted my shoulder with each pull of the trigger, and my arm went numb. The rifle fell into the snow and despite the men's insistence, I could not lift it again. He and Uncle Rich continued to laugh. My ears rang on and off, and I went inside the camper. The sun had dropped by then, and I figured the quickest way for this horrible trip to be over was to get to bed as early as I could and sleep through it. Inside the camper was a makeshift bed and a couch atop which sat my sleeping bag. After kicking my boots off and hanging my jacket on the wall, I slid inside it and zipped it up. From inside, I could hear Dad and my uncle laughing and drinking, reminiscing about years gone by, and just when I reached the edge of sleep, I heard the truck stereo click on again. What was the point of spending time out in nature if they were just going to spoil it? I closed my eyes. And like every night as a child, just before falling to sleep, I prayed. I prayed for family, for friends, 
for patience and for peace. Without knowing when, the world around me vanished and I drifted within. Many hours later, I blinked awake at the sound of an argument. The stereo was still blaring outside, but Dad and Uncle Rich were shouting over it. I unzipped my sleeping bag and crept over to the camper's back window. The glass was dirty, making it difficult to look outside, but my eyes soon focused, and against the light of the campfire, I saw the two men surrounded by bottles and bent over in a brawl. Dad had Uncle Rich in a headlock and was mercilessly throwing his fist into the side of his head. Uncle Rich pushed against the rocky ground with his legs and sent them both backward till they slammed hard against the camper. As the walls rocked around me, I jumped back from the window. The two staggered forward toward the fire. Dad lost his grip and Uncle Rich slid out from under him. Then he sent a left hook into Dad's side, and my father dropped to one knee. Uncle Rich pounced and rained elbow after elbow onto the back of his head till Dad finally mustered the strength to lift himself back onto his feet, putting Uncle Rich into the dirt. My heart thumped against my chest. Everything within me was screaming to race outside and beg them to stop, but my legs simply wouldn't move. This was how it would end, how it always was going to end. They would kill each other. I would see them die, and I would be alone, and I would die. My thoughts and worries raced, and I scarcely even thought to pray when all at once the pair began to laugh and slap each other as siblings. Dad's nose was dripping blood, and Uncle Rich's forehead was gashed open. Yet both men walked back to their overturned chairs as if nothing at all was amiss, and the cooler between them was popped open, and their aimless chatter resumed. My heart settled, my legs soon loosened, and I went back to bed. The door to the camper opened early in the morning and Dad shook me awake. Let's get moving. What are you going to do today? When I stepped outside, I found Uncle Rich passed out in the truck bed. Dad told me to let him sleep, and we quickly packed and set out for the deer stand. With only two occupants, things were much more comfortable, and I was able to stretch out some on the platform as Dad took his post and began scanning the woods. We had packed along the last of the sandwiches, and I ate mine in only a handful of bites. By this time, I was starving, shook up, and ready to go home. I had the sense Dad was ready to clear out too, but felt pressured to have something to show for the weekend. His face was swollen from the scuffle with Uncle Rich the night before, but neither of us mentioned it. We stayed silent for several hours, and I killed the time by watching the trees and daydreaming about all the things I'd do if I ever made it back home. The weight was crushing. I had my Game Boy in my pocket, but pulling it out probably would have sent Dad into a fury. He seemed shaky, and I wasn't going to risk crossing him. As I stifled a yawn and stuffed my sandwich bag into my pocket, I quickly became aware that something had changed. It's been 20 years, but in all the time since, nothing has filled me with greater dread than hearing those woods go suddenly silent. Not a single creature made a sound, and my father, finally sensing the shift too, held his breath and gripped his gun. Then, I smelled it. Dad's nose wrinkled, too, and we both covered our faces instinctively. A putrid stench, like burned flesh, filled the woods all at once, 
A wild-eyed expression came over Dad's face as he looked to me, and I wrenched over in my seat, thinking I might vomit. I felt woozy, lightheaded, like I was poisoned. Dad also seemed to go pale, and then noise came cascading down from the trees all around us. We both looked out, and my feet locked like they had the night before. Birds. Dozens. Maybe hundreds of birds toppling from the trees and hitting the snowy ground below at full force. Dead. All of them. All at once. Suddenly. Dead. My stomach churned, and I realized I was covered in sweat. I turned to Dad for direction, but he simply sat and stared out, transfixed at what lay before him. And then came the howl. A bellow that rattled my bones. I turned from my father to follow his eyeline, and I saw it. Emerging from the distant trees was a monstrous bear, only, only not a bear, something, something unnatural, something horrific and repulsive, something of nightmares. Long, muddied, black hair, a mane, and snarling long teeth like a lion from hell. Red eyes that pierced even the light of day, and from its head two towering, pointed horns. And then the woods came alive. Squirrels and raccoons, critters all around us emerged from hiding places and bolted away from the howling monster. My legs went from iron to jelly, and I dropped out of my chair and onto all fours. But Dad, Dad rose to his feet and leveled his rifle. Yet when the beast howled once more, my father stiffened and did not or could not fire. I reached up and grabbed his pant leg, which seemed to send a shock through his system, and he pulled the trigger. My ears rang, and he grabbed me, ushering me down the ladder, and we ran. Outpacing me, Dad grabbed my hand and pulled me forward. I stumbled, and he lifted me off of my feet, carrying me in his arms, but this slowed our flight, and I wrestled out from his grip and back onto the wet ground. I didn't dare look back. Then Dad grabbed my hand again and pulled me hard right toward an outcrop of rocks. I could see a small opening, a cave. As we barreled ahead, my hearing returned and the sound of our boots hitting rock filled my ears. We fell inside and were plunged into darkness. Dad put his hand over my mouth and I kicked him hard. He held me down all the same and we laid there for several uncomfortable minutes. The stench of the ragged beast hung in the air still, mixed with the wet and moldy smell of the cave, and when I finally settled, Dad sat up and opened his bag. He quietly rummaged inside, and I heard him pull something out. Then a soft click, another click, and another. He shook his hands roughly, and the clicking continued, and my heart sank as I realized in horror that he was trying to switch on his flashlight. I wanted to speak up, to explain, to say, to say I was sorry, to say I was scared, but no words came. And then my father stood, and slowly headed toward the mouth of the cave. I tried to follow him, but he squeezed my shoulder and pushed me backward to tell me to wait. So I did, and for a long time, I prayed. I prayed for family, for friends, for patience, and for peace. And in the darkness, I finally heard footsteps, a hand on my arm, and then we stepped together into the light. The scorched scent was gone, and the woods seemed to have settled. Dad guided us back toward our beaten path, and we returned to the campsite in silence. <laughs> 
Our steps were heavy now and labored, and it took much longer than it had before, but sure enough, when the camper came into view and as I reached the truck, I saw Uncle Rich waiting in the passenger seat, looking annoyed. He expressed his disappointment that we hadn't bagged a buck, but I simply shrugged and slid into the center seat as Dad quickly checked over the campsite and then joined us. He tried putting the keys in the ignition, but his hands were shaking, and it took longer than it should have. Uncle Rich offered to drive, but Dad shook his head and finally managed to get the truck started. The drive home passed quickly as I fell asleep in my seat within minutes. I heard the men speak only briefly and about nothing in particular. They both were exhausted. Dad dropped Uncle Rich off at his house and didn't so much as give him a wave after he had stepped out and made his way toward the front door. We drove home, stopping once for gas, and as the truck finally pulled into our driveway and came to a halt, Dad pulled the keys from the ignition and turned to me, staring down at the floorboard. And there, he made me promise that we'd never talk about the trip again, and I wouldn't say a thing to Mom. It was the winter of 2002. I haven't been hunting since. This video was sponsored by Storyblocks. This week, I wanted to try telling an original story, and the assets I found on Storyblocks helped bring it to life. Their unlimited access plan gave me a royalty-free library full of videos, images, music, and sound effects, providing me with plenty of resources and reference material. Maybe you want to make videos too, and you've been looking for a way to easily fill your projects with high-quality audio and visuals. Look no further than Storyblocks. Blocks. Choose a subscription plan that works within your budget and you'll get access to royalty-free assets, not just stock footage. They've even got project templates for Adobe After Effects and Premiere Pro. Storyblocks helps creators save time, make more, and get inspired. Check them out using the link in this video's description.